Welcome. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Jarrigar and Turbal people, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, welcome. Today we're going to talk about a topic that doesn't sound terribly sexy. Citation. But uh, we hope to show you just how sexy citation can be, how divisive an issue, how it can be used for good and evil, and give you some ways to frame your own citation counts and indices. Um, uh, and also, oh, you know, with reference to your discipline, of course, um, and to other ways of showing how important your research um, is. Also, while we're going to talk, I guess, primarily about citation metrics, we have a librarian, well, two librarians here, actually. Um, I want to talk a little bit later about some of the other ways that we might think about citation, particularly who we cite and why and what kind of consequences that can have, um, so that we can cite in a more mindful way ourselves, I think. All right, so I'll introduce our panellists um, tonight. <laughs> um, on the end here we have Alicia Bignell, who is the Acting Manager of Research Outputs and Impact with UQ Library. She works across research data management, impact metrics, um, where she provides training advice and support for grant proposals and promotion, as well as preparing strategic reports related to collaboration and impact. And she's also worked at a range of libraries, including for Education Queensland, I believe. Oh, yes. how did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I googled that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's all on LinkedIn, Alicia. Mm, um, of welcome to Alicia. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Chris Roy Smith, who is a professor, professor of international relations. Before joining UQ, he held chairs at the European University Institute and the Australian National University. He's co editor of the Cambridge Studies and in International Relations book series, former editor of the journal International Theory, and editor of a new multi volume series of Oxford Handbooks of International Relations. He has 7,209 citations and his H index is 33. Please welcome Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Jess White is a postdoctoral fellow through the UQ Amplify program, continuing her work from her ARC DECRA on life writing. Jessica is also a writer of fiction and non-fiction with several books and many stories under her belt with quality literary publishers. Her latest book, Hearing Maud, is a memoir that narrates Jess's own experience of hearing loss alongside that of novelist Rosa Prayed's daughter, Maud. Jess doesn't even have a Google Scholar profile, <laughs> <laughs> but she has been shortlisted for multiple awards and has successfully received funding and residencies from Australian arts bodies. Please welcome Jess. <laughs> As for me, I'm Associate um, Professor Kim Wilkins. I'm the Deputy ADR in the Faculty of Haas. I have scored roughly 1% of Chris's citations, but I do have 20,000 ratings on Goodreads. Not that it's a competition. <laughs> you win. <laughs> <laughs> and all of Pretty us well valid, I think anyone going to say. <laughs> and all of us have strong opinions on citation and the other ways, I hope you picked up from what I was saying, that we may measure our, um, our, our worth. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward very much to a lively chat. So Alicia, I'm actually going to start with you. Okay. I know that you've worked a lot with medical and health sciences because I googled that on your LinkedIn oh, right, profile. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's your take on how differently the citation patterns and indices function in the Haas disciplines from STEM disciplines? Um, well, it's definitely a different behaviour in terms of citation. So um, I guess when I'm analysing someone's track record, it's quite easy in medical and health sciences. They do cite each other a fair bit and it's quite translatable, whereas it is a very different behaviour in some of the Haas disciplines. There's just not the need to talk about each other's work or even build on the work like you do in other disciplines like the health and sciences where you are building on previous research all the time. Um, so I, I guess probably when it does come to Haas, we do have to unpack citations a lot more than what I would, you know, would have to in health and medical science. So this is where in um, has I would probably be drilling down to see the who is citing you, why are they citing you, um, you know, is it in a good light or a not so good light or is it a, in a fully supporting light? What are they really saying? Where's it coming from? Um, are they coming, you know, the source of the information as in like, is the citation coming from someone affiliated with some prestigious institution? Or are they, what's the journal like that 
the citations coming from. It's really about unpacking it all. Mm -hmm. Um, and for those who might not know, how is the H index calculated? Um, okay, so I suppose to give an example, if you've got a H index of, was it 33? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means you have at least 33 publications that have been cited at least 33 times. So, so it's sort of not very dependent on how many publications you have, but you have to have at least that, you know, like H number cited at least that same H number. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it <laughs> yeah. makes total sense. And of course, that's why mm. sciences, well, STEM disciplines do so much better in H index because there's 15 people on every paper and they all yes. write 15 papers each citing yes. it. Yes, <laughs> there's a bit of, you know, they sometimes talk about that. There's even a trend, you know, over time that there's more sort of like what they call sort of hyper authorism where there's more and more authors on papers mm -hmm. so they do find that people earlier in their career will often have a lot more papers to their name but I was reading something recently where they said that there's probably less early career researchers that are like say for first author on a paper because they just sort of mm. come onto papers and there is a lot of question about their contribution at times too. Mm. Mm. I always think that's mm. good to know in case anyone is obsessed with their H index I hope you're not it's just a <coughs> terrible road to go down. Yeah. I have a <laughs> literary scholar friend who's obsessed with hers and I'm just like <laughs> 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 it's meaningless. Anyway, we'll get on to that. Chris and Jess, let's turn to you now. How do you feel about the way that measures of success and value in STEM disciplines um, keep getting foisted on us over here in the Haas disciplines? Do you have anything to say about that? Um, I think it's really clunky. Mm. Um, it's a different discipline. Like, how can you sh like force it on top of the humanities and expect the humanities to come up with the same mm. results? Mm. I don't think it works. Mm. Yep. Chris? Mm. So, uh, I mean, I guess I'm much more skeptical about them being used in any context, yep. let alone, let alone by, by disciplines. In the sense, and let's take the H index as a good example. So, you can achieve an H index of 33 by having 33 publications, each of which have no more than 33 citations. Right? Or you can achieve an H index of 33 by having a paper that has, or a book that has 3,000 citations, ramping down 1,000, mm. 500, 300, until you get to 33. Mm. Clearly the person who has that second profile has had much more attention to their work than the first person, but the number hides that. And so, you know, when I went, I, I had to Google a friend of mine who's a leading political scientist at the University of Melbourne the other day to find out her phone number. And, I, and so I Googled it, and they now have a lovely page on Melbourne where you come up, uh, you know, your scholar page, and it's this full picture of you, and then it's your vital statistics underneath. And it's, uh, you know, professor so-and-so, research interests, and then at the bottom of it is your H index, which is utterly meaningless and I think that uh, and one of the problems with uh, with this is that we're using these as kind of shorthand measures as to the value and contribution of people's research where it in fact is such a blunt instrument it not only hides the variation across disciplines but it also hides the content of the citation profile itself so if you're going to use it and you know, I'll finish here if you're going to use it at all, then the only reasonable measure would be to say, here's my H index, and within that H index, there's an average of X number of citations per publication in that 33, let's say. And that's the only reasonable way of reading it. And of course, then there's also this, the issues about who's citing it, where it's being cited, and so forth. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I'm a skeptic about the use of these. Yeah. I think, leading on from that, it's how you tell the story about the data that you have. Yeah that makes the difference. You can massage those statistics any way you want. And it's the story that helps you do that, I think, mm. when you're writing applications. Mm. So what do we, well, I'm gonna come back to that specifically, applications. Yep. Yep. But um, the, on that, where you were talking about your friend's um, profile on the University of Melbourne site, mm. there wasn't room for that story. There was just the, the figures. There wasn't like, you know, H index of whatever, and then a little star, and then down the bottom, blah, blah, blah. But even if there had been, it's almost like it's secondary. The story that we get to tell is secondary about that because I don't know why the university or the world is so obsessed with 
with metrics. Mm. Um, so um, I guess how how can we push back against that? I mean, would you if UQ introduced that, would you refuse to have your H index revealed? You wouldn't even know what yours was, no. would you? Just? <laughs> 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 it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I probably wouldn't refuse, partly because it's it's public knowledge. Yeah, and, and yours and is go, good. I have, I have a public. <laughs> I have, but but on the other hand, it's you know, and this is I actually think these discussions are much more important for junior scholars than yeah. they are for senior scholars. Mm -hmm. So I think the critical questions are how should junior scholars handle these metrics? Mm -hmm. So, and I've seen you're starting to see people that are writing applications that are saying, well. You know, I published this and it's got 15 citations and I have an H-index of three and whatever else. Now, that, those numbers are no indication of the quality of that person's Absolutely. work or their contribution. And I think the problem is that somewhere along the line we've got into a situation where we think that that's an appropriate way or a required thing for junior scholars to be doing. If they're going to do it, then I think at your point earlier, is absolutely crucial is you need to be you need to unpack those mm. and talk about who is engaging with your work in what context and in what way so I can think of a, a, of a, of a kind of superstar junior scholar in our school uh, and her work is you know part of her impact is that her work is being is absolutely pivotal to international debates. She's a real leader. But you're not going to see that from the citations. You have to unpack that and you have to put it into a, a narration. So in, the, in a sense, the number becomes far less important than the, than the qualitative fleshing out of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, Jess, um, you were successful with gaining ARC funding in, mm -hmm. with your DECRA, um, even though you've got a mixed profile of both traditional and, and scholarly publications. Yeah. How do you tell that story of traditional and non-traditional research in a grant application? Uh, well, I can only draw on my experience. Yeah, sure, that's yeah. really um, yeah. And I used the word science communication. So I'm writing a work of creative non-fiction about Western Australia's first female scientist, Georgiana Malloy, who came to Western Australia in the 1830s. She arrived in 1830. And I knew I couldn't get a creative writing ARC grant because you go to the Australia Council. The Australia Council for the Arts will fund creative works. So I placed myself in literary studies and I've always had two strands, one in literature, one in creative writing. And I used the word science communication and I said, I am, I am using my skills in creative writing to convey this information to reach a wider audience than I might otherwise do within an institution. So it's about engagement. That was the focus. And yeah. did you sell your um, your profile as a writer? Did that come into your application? Oh, very at all? much so. Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of things would you emphasise about that in an application? You know, to in the place of something a blunt instrument like a, a citation count. How how can you use that kind of um, material? Uh, well, I listed all my awards that I got for writing. Mm -hmm. I listed my research skills, which would help me write the books. Um, I talked about things like engaging with audiences mm -hmm. through library talks, through Brisbane Writers Festival. Mm -hmm. So I was about uh, the focus of my work was about connecting with audiences and getting the material and the research out of the institution and into the public realm. Right. And I was using my skills as a writer to yeah. do that. So and you're building on the strengths that you yeah, have exactly. rather than trying to yep. paper over a yeah, gap. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. 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 It's just yeah. sometimes it does feel like when you're writing a grant application, because um, I have a mixed profile like Jess, mm -hmm. that you are trying to paper over a gap. They seem to expect to see mm -hmm. what your citation metrics are. So, Alicia, do you have any, um, you know, what are some of the other ways we can show our, our little pieces of impact oh, without I the numbers? Oh, oh um, no, with, with alternative numbers. Yeah, well, I guess probably I, I have to mention here, like aside from this, you know, citations as they are at the moment come from, it's all confined to the academic community. So this is where you can talk about your attention and influence from outside of the academic community. So um, at UQ, we've just got a subscription to a great resource called Altmetric Explorer. Mm -hmm. And this is where you can look up yourself or your school or whatever. And you can um, see basically it it has a, it, it's sort of your online attention and it comes from a number of different sources. So a lot of your social media sources, your Facebook, your Twitter, all that. Um, it does draw from policy documents. It does draw from blogs and Wikipedia and oh, there's a number of things. It, it's always expanding, but that is one way 
place to actually look to see where your attention is and even drill down to that just like you do with citations to see who's it coming from, what are they saying, um, and some of those sources are very influential, especially if they're blogs from someone who's quite a thought leader in the field. Um, so that's, I mean, <laughs> to an extent that's still also a little bit number based, but I try not to focus on the numbers mm. with that. The real value or quality, if you're looking for that, is actually looking at, at where it's coming from, the attention. Um, so I guess that's one source, but you know, like other things, if you have been writing books, we look at other metrics, like you can look at library holdings, mm. see where it's being held. Um, you can look at book reviews, you know, like that's always a great selling point. Um, or even if you know anything about the sales of the book, it can be a bit harder to find that, but that's, a, you know, I suppose that is another metric, but it is something that you can use. Um, Good reads yeah. reviews. Yeah. I hear that's a very good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thing. Yeah. That's all I've got. Give it to me. <laughs> another thing that they do look for on um, applications, it might depend on the one, but like what your collaboration is like, you know, other aspects of your research when we are looking at metrics um, and what your contribution is to that field as well. Mm. So, mm. yeah. But given the world's not quite as sensible as you, Alicia, <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, can, can Chris, imagine a future <coughs> where your altmetric score is the new H index, mm. right? So how do you feel now about, your, about the number that you're valued by? Yours would probably the still be high. Well, the, 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 the idea, so, you know, I, I, on, on several occasions, I applied for a, a, big, a big grant and so I was given various advice about how to pitch myself for mm. the big grant. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, things like Altmetric <coughs> and all these things come into this. But <coughs> I found that I actually, I think I needed counselling at the end of the process. And, and, and in fact, one of the reasons why I opted out of it is the counselling bill was becoming too expensive. <laughs> because I, I started to judge myself on the basis of these numbers. And I started to make insidious comparisons with other right. people who I thought might be competitors. That's what everybody's been doing with you all this time. And I, I think this is a, and, and, I, and I, I worry about this because <coughs> I actually, you know, I think, I think one of the things that I think we all have to do is actually, you know, keep a focus on the nature of our research, the community of scholarship and the wider constituency that we want to engage with and keep an eye on that on that ball and, and on the on the on the in a sense on the on the you know the qualitative the things that we're doing to encourage that and become not so obsessed with the numbers. Now of course we do, you know, pe they, people do expect to see these numbers, but I think that we need to put them in a sense on the on the you know on the back burner and, and understand that you know there's a there was a great little book called How to Lie with Statistics. And I think that this is you know this is something that these numbers encourage it encourages people to distort a story so one of the pieces of sorry one of the pieces of I, no, advice no, please, i was given by a senior colleague who had been successful in one of these big grants was well get you know put make your google scholar profile public and then what you've got to do is you put in areas of interest because then you'll be able to see exactly where you rank yeah. in the world so I, th I went home i thought okay well let's have a bit of an experiment so i I put in my areas of interest. So I put in international law and a few other things. And actually, I had this sort of moment where a huge boost to my self-esteem because I discovered that I'm the 14th most cited person in international law in the world. Now, that is uh, anyone who knows me or knows international law or knows anybody even of m moderate status in international law would know that that's absolutely absurd. <laughs> so, I, I th so, what, so what was that actually measuring? What I was actually measuring was that I am, have the 14th highest number of citations under international law among people who list international law <laughs> as an area of interest. <laughs> and it, it turns out that international lawyers, A, don't care about Google profiles, <laughs> so they have them. And, and, and don't listen. So basically, I was 14th among a bunch of non-international lawyers, <laughs> right, who happened to, as a hobby, list themselves <laughs> as international law. Now, you know, if I had gone and put that, if I'd done that mm. or made some claim to this in an application, wow, you know, I'm 14th most cited. You know, anybody who read that application would have thought that it was even less competitive than it actually was. <laughs> yes, I hear you. So it does, um, 
It does bring me to a lovely segue, and that is, um, as you say, you can lie with statistics, you can game the system, and I'm not talking about that. But have you observed in your practice, whether you've done it deliberately or not, ways that you can make yourself more citable? And I'm thinking again about young scholars mm -hmm. um, and ECRs and how they might start to build their citation count because we are stuck with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. can you think of any ways? I've got a list of ideas too. If you, Does anyone have any ideas? Mm -hmm. No? I, I think maybe what you call the title, like it, yeah. it, it's a draw card whether someone reads it or not and if they read it they're more likely to cite it. So Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, how they describe it mm -hmm. um, and also I, I guess probably putting it in a language that does appeal to readership, <laughs> like you mm. know, um, yeah. yeah. Chris, is there anything that you've noticed worked with you? Well, I've I, mean, I mean, I've never gone, I mean, I've never gone out there trying to yeah. make this stuff work, but, but here I'm speaking more as an editor. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the, you know, I work for, I, I'm an editor for both Cambridge and Oxford University Presses, and the presses are becoming uh, increasingly focused on, uh, on titles and how the titles, how searchable titles are. So your titles, you know, we all like to have a little rhetorical flourish, you know, the funny little in-joke that, you know, IR scholars or political theorists or somebody might make, you know, <laughs> we, we, we turn two <laughs> words into something else, which means something else yet again, right? Yeah. Okay, and, and, but nobody's ever gonna search that except the person who got the joke in the first place and, and was looking at your piece anyway. Um, so thinking about, you know, how you create titles that put in the kind of the words that you know that so I, I wrote a piece called the concept of intervention and that was quite deliberate that I titled it that simply because I actually wanted everybody who was writing on intervention to hit that piece not because of the citations but because I wanted it in the debate mm -hmm. because I wanted to shift the debate and that has been quite a, you know quite a successful piece and I, so I think doing I think doing that I think thinking about um, using social media like to make people make let people know that your work is there so you know it does at times look like shameless sort of self-promotion but actually letting people know when you have an article that's come out on a topic and you don't have to do it in a flashy way but that means that you know what's actually hidden in the you know in the spine of a journal somewhere people actually come to know it whereas they may not come to know <coughs> it other other than through that yeah. uh, so doing things like that, I think, is, is, is important. But the other thing is choosing the journals to hit the constituency you want to engage. And that's a general piece of advice, I think, for all scholars. And that is that, you know, different things that you write are going, you're going to want those to engage different audiences often. They might be kind of different but overlapping audiences. So thinking about uh, where you place something is really important for engaging the audience mm. that you that that you want. So, I've some of some some of my most well cited articles are articles that that I decided it was really important to engage the I wanted to engage the American Acad North American Academy mm -hmm. on. And so, those pieces are in a very high profile journal, and that is they they did engage that community in a way that if I had placed that piece somewhere else, they would not have, it would not have engaged that community. So I think thinking about what is your constituency, what is mm. your community mm. of scholarship, and it's going to, it's going to vary a lot, a lot. And this has to do also with how you interpret people's citation counts. Yeah. So if you happen to be somebody who writes, you know, I'm a, I'm a general theorist of international relations. So the stuff that I write engages kind of sort of big conceptual and theoretical questions at the center of the field, right? So there's actually a fair constituency of people that might, might be interested in reading that stuff. But for example, if you're somebody who's a feminist international relations scholar, and this is a, an indictment of my field, but the chances are that that's a smaller reading constituency than the general broader constituency. So you, you can, so, so, but if you want to engage that constituency, There'll be particular outlets that you would choose that will get will engage that constituency very well. Whereas placing a piece in another in another journal might that piece might get lost. So, um, if I'm hearing you right, there's quite a few things I want to pick up out of that. But if I'm hearing you right, it's the same thing with the titles. It's not about 
making them inclusive. It's just about making them less exclusive. Right. Yeah. Right. So there's, you know, don't cut out some of your readership. Right. But I'm really interested that you say, you know, I, you know, you do have quite a deliberate, quite a number of deliberate strategies for increasing the readership of your articles. And as you say, that's not about being cited. That's about being in the debate. Right. And the issue that I, that well, the thing that occurred to me then was that we are using citation indices as though they, as a as a substitute for being in the debate, as a substitute for how, counting how much we're in the debate, right. aren't they? Right. But now they've sort of become detached from that, and they're just these kind of numbers that mean nothing. Right. But it is actually, as you say, about being in the debate. So that might be another thing to think about when we're, you know, writing the narrative around our numbers. I'm going to come back to Alicia in a minute with something about social media and altmetrics. But Jess, um, so with your work, both academic and scholarly, do you do you boost a signal on social media for your yeah, work? Yeah, I have a blog and I have a newsletter, yeah. um, which I put out every two months. Um, I don't have many subscribers <laughs> for my <laughs> newsletter, yeah. but I my research is based in southwest Western Australia. Um, that's where the botanists lived. And I'm starting to get emails from people wanting to know more information about that. So I wrote a, um, about that area and that history of that area. So I wrote an article um, on a massacre of Wodundi Noongar people in that area. And someone, a fellow blogger who's in my blogging community, included that article on his blog. Um, I can't remember the context it was. He was writing about um, massacres in Western Australia. And people keep hitting on his... Mm post and it comes back to me and they come and ask me the questions and so people know that I'm working on that material. Someone wants to know about um, a child who was mentioned in Georgiana Malloy's letters and she's tracing her family history. So they're my audiences. It's that community that I'm engaging with. So that is a measure of mm. success for me because mm. I'm connecting with them through the story that, yeah. I'm, that I'm telling. So I use social media, I have my newsletter, I have a blog, so I blog about the places that I go and the research that I'm doing. So when the book comes out, people are gonna know that I'm the person who's been doing this research. Mm. And I have to do that because there's a woman over there who has published a biography of Georgiana Malloy, and mine is not the same. Um, it's more environmentally focused. But because I'm not a local from that area, people are gonna be suspicious because it's so far away. So I'm building a profile in the area. So when the book comes out, my research will be valid to those people in that oh, community. That's very clever. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. that deliberate strategy? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. They're very, very, um, because they're so far away, they feel cut off from the rest of Australia. So if I come barging in, yeah. and there's a lot of resistance because mm. I'm from the other side of the East Coast. Mm. So that's um, that's something that I've been experiencing, pe these, like people just brushing you off. And so I just keep persisting. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just talking to other scholars in that area. So I had a coffee with a guy when I was over there last. He didn't know about my research, but it was perfectly aligned with his field. So I just went and say, I just found him and then said, let's have a coffee. Mm -hmm. So I just talked to people as well. Do you, do you have Twitter? Yeah. You do? Yeah. And do yeah. You, you like announce when you yes. publish something and, yeah. and that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, all the time. And Facebook's very active. Yeah. yeah, I don't do Twitter. It's, it's frightening. I find it oh yeah, there's a lot of angry, grumpy people. Oh, everyone's <laughs> angry or right wing or angry and left wing. Yeah, so I um I have a I connect my author page on Facebook to my Twitter account. So that means I don't have to read much of Twitter. Right. I do a lot of engagement on Facebook and on Instagram. Instagram is fantastic because there's no angry people. Yeah, I know, that's <laughs> yeah. the one I like. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So um, I publicise my books, I publicise my research. When I'm out travelling and doing my research, I put photos up. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's mm. a lot of engagement that way with different audiences. Alicia, how mm. much of that will Altmetric be picking up? Um, Altmetric picks up Instagram, I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. but it, yeah, it, Twitter it does, and it does track with Twitter, things like if it can track the location of where that Twitter account is, it, okay. it can show the demographics and if it knows that it's someone in a certain field like a, a health practitioner or a science communicator, then it will let you know that. Um, yeah, but you know, like uh, with twi tweet and you know, tweets and retweets, the actual score that actually comes from that, it's not very highly weighted mm. Twitter. So I think retweets are about quarter of a point our oh, tweets are a half a point, um, something like that. I'm not sure, <laughs> don't quote me. But I guess probably it's become known now that, um, you know, if someone does put a paper or a link to a paper or something that would be picked up on Twitter, it can automatically be retweeted again by three or four other accounts. They've bots set up to do that. So it's kind of mm. set up. So they don't, 
like we don't pay a whole lot of attention to that. Um, yeah, though at Maltrick itself is sort of getting a little bit smarter in that as well, in that they're actually restricting it so that people can't game it as much. So I, the only one account can sort of tweet that one paper once sort of thing. Or that's all that will be counted mm -hmm. basically mm. towards that score. And do they still have to include a link to something with the DOI for it to be counted? Um, yeah, so anything that's got an identifier, it doesn't have to be a DOI. So there's a number of other identifiers. So for books, it will be like ISBNs. Um, and also now they've got another algorithm, probably more relevant to other sources, like with policy documents, they do have an algorithm of just matching up sort of text and where it can be. It's not perfect, it does make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but ideally if you want your paper or something or research output, whatever it is, like whether it be an image or something, if you want it actually to be picked up, it should have an identifier attached to it, which mm. most things you can get an identifier. It's, it's, there's quite a long list of identifier types that it does pick up now. Mm -hmm. That's worth thinking mm. about everyone. Well, before, when I asked you that question, I had actually asked a bunch of my friends um, some of the ways that you might want to Use not to game the system, <coughs> but to increase the um, uh, the the um, your citation count. Okay, one of my friends said, "Coin a phrase that everyone wants to use, <laughs> such as um, Axel Bruns when he um, uh, coined the word producer." Um, uh, now everyone who wants to use that word has to go back and find his original article and cite it, and it's got a, a very very high citation count. Um, include highly citable sentences around your key ideas. Make it really easy for people just to cut and paste a quote out of your work and into theirs and then cite you. Um, uh, and get your citable sentence into the abstract if you can because a lot of people only read the abstract. So <laughs> <laughs> they all sound like terribly cynical ways to, you know, to, to game the system. So let's move away from the cynicism now and to something a bit more um, uh, a bit more enlightened, thinking about some of those other aspects of citation. Recently there was a bit of a um, kerfuffle actually on Twitter when a professor of psychi uh, psychiatry from Montreal published an article on E.ON which is a bit like the conversation, it's the sort of lay outlet for academic research. And in the article he cited over a dozen other scholars and every single one of them was a white man. And they were mostly people who didn't need their signal boosted, like Bakhtin, Derrida, Foucault. And then he cited a few creative writers, also all men, um, including um, Edgar Allan <coughs> Poe and so on. Do you think, panel, <coughs> it would have behooved this presser to Google black female philosopher and go from there? Or do you think that that is standard academic practice and should continue? It's, oh, that was a really, I've really put you all on the spot, haven't I? No, no, I think, um, it is standard academic practice, but I don't think anyone stops to think about who they're citing. There is a movement to encourage people yeah, to start thinking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and friends of mine do not include white men in their bibliographies as a way of moving away. That's a little that. extreme. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's um. a way of pushing back against it. Um, so I think it's a really good practice mm -hmm. to start including those kinds of works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chris, do you, you have an opinion on that, Chris? So that's uh, a it, deep question. So it's, it, it's interesting because it, in, in international relations at the moment, there's, there's, there's two areas in which this is pushing. So one is to, is to stop the, the practice of only citing men. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other is that there's a move to globalise the field. Mm -hmm. So the move to cite non-Western yeah. authors. Mm -hmm. And you know, both of the, so, so both of these are, are in, in one, in, in the, on the gender question, there's a, I think, a really important project of, of recovering, as part of this is actually recovering women who've been very important thinkers in mm. the field, but who've basically been written out of the field. So one example of this would be uh, Coral Bell, who, mm -hmm. was, uh, who died recently, who was a uh, very eminent international relations scholar. The, they've named the Headley uh, Bull building and a particular school They've named that the Coral Bell School of, um, of Politics and International Relations at the ANU. But there's, there would be very few people that have actually read or cited Coral's work in recent years, even though there's a kind of recognition mm. that she was an important figure. People have not been reading her work, which is a, which is a tragedy. But it was, it, what's interesting is that she was an arch realist. 
which is a traditionally very male kind of profile in international relations. But her work could very easily be used as an exemplar of that tradition of thought in a way that, in a way that you know, men are just usually used as, a, a, as the exemplars. So the fact that women have been written out of the field is a really important dimension of this non-citation. It's mm. not that women haven't been there or haven't been contributing. It's just that the, the, the gendered nature of this extends well beyond citation. Yeah. It's actually mm. a project of marginalisation. Another example on the globalised front would be you know, scholars that are writing about uh, the engagement between uh, the sort of European processes of imperialism but never citing any non-European authors as part of that of that process and and there's a there's a kind of quite a, a, a heated politics around this mm. in the field at the moment which I think is very important mm. you have any opinions on it Alicia have you ever heard no, of it or? I haven't but it does I mean it, it, I find it intriguing because it is a citation behavior and I do wonder how that influences things going forward mm. or even looking back I mean with the tools that we use I mean there's no filter to say male female or not mm. either or whatever so we can't do that but you bring up the you know, the point of like, you know, non-European or, you know, I, it does make me think if there sort of can be some analysis in terms of looking where citations come from or go um, with, uh, you know, non-English, mm -hmm. you know, mm. um, sources. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I know mm. about this because I have a friend who's very, very, I, I, I write with her actually, and she's always like, let's not cite that guy, let's see if we can find a female scholar to look mm. at first. And I'm totally down with that. But I always say to her, but you don't know that guy's circumstances. He might be working class, he might be, you know, trans, you don't know just mm. from the name or mm. from the picture. So I'm on board with it on in principle, but yeah, it's one of those things where I feel like, um, I do think it's a good thing to do. And I do think, I, you know, I don't think that um, only white guys have the answers. Um, and but your story about Coral Bell is a really good mm. demonstration of um, how if we just go, well, we, everyone reaches for the usual suspect mm. because they've seen it everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that citation behaviour, as you called it, Alicia, is a way to sort of start changing that. But mm. yeah. yeah, I don't know if I'll stop citing white guys altogether. I quite like white guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how about other ways that we can use the citations that we write to build the field, to promote excellent work, to bring world peace? Do you cite your friends? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got any academic <laughs> friends from my side. You've got me, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I have used you in an article I wrote on Cli-Fi. There you are. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I've got a I'm looking at the camera. I think that's the um, Yeah. yeah uh, but do you cite your friends? I mean, it's a question, right? I cite my friends if their article's relevant. I look for ways to, you know, boost up the academics I know. Or do you think that's not what citation's for? So I think it depends on, on mm. uh, partly on your writing style yeah. and what you're doing. I mean, I'm... I'm an argumentative sort of person. Oh so, yeah. I, so it's better not I, to a be lot cited of the people, by you. Uh, well, a lot <laughs> of the people that, you know, so a lot of the way, a lot of the things that I write are about, are about arguments and about advancing arguments. So a lot of the people that I'm citing mm. are people that I don't disagree, that I don't agree with. Yeah, okay. Right? And so, and it, it's not, it's not that I'm, that I'm, you know, they're, they're being cited just for the sake of criticism, but mm. it's as part of it, as part of a process of trying to build gotcha. a build an argument. Mm. And I think that you, you so sometimes you cite because somebody else's work is a helpful yeah. building block, <laughs> and sometimes you cite because you're trying to create a space in which the argument that you want to make happens. And I think this goes also to how we engage the question of gender, for example. So you know, I've recently just written the I've just written the new um, Oxford very short introduction to international relations and I was actually really conscious of my citation practices there they don't have many citations in fact they don't have any footnotes so you'd have maybe five citations in each in each chapter um, and I found that w the way I was citing was that I was u often using authors as an exemplar of a particular position like I was so for example I was talking about somebody called Charles Tilley who made a ar particular argument about the role that war played in the evolution of sovereign states. Now, he's the only person that made that argument. There was nobody and a, there other people following him. There's no way that I could avoid citing him. So I, I found myself citing men more often than I mm. wanted to because of the nature of the citation 
what I was doing here. But what I did do was in there, they have further reading sections. And I actually sat back and I said, every one of these readings is going to be by a woman. <laughs> and I think I think ninety something ninety five percent of the readings that I've put in there is by a woman scholar, and that was how I kind of tried to yeah. deal with that question of the kind of where I found myself in this jam as the kinds of things I had to cite directly, but then by trying to expand the field of debate and readership. Mm. So it a lot depends on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to cite, as to how you navigate that space. Mm. That's great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to the audience now to see if they have anything to add on this or any other questions about citations, citation <laughs> metrics, how you can use them to get grants, get promotions, make yourself sound um, exciting. Did you get that joke? That was another dad joke. <laughs> exciting? Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was funny, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> Just laugh. What would you like to ask our, our wise panel? You're not allowed to go until at least three people have asked questions. <laughs> well, this isn't a question so much as a comment yeah. uh, on what's happening. I'm Angela Hannon. I'm a librarian for the School of Communication and Arts. Um, and I have helped people um, develop sort of metric reports. And I have to admit, one of the first things that out of the box that I wanted to say to people was, we sort of talked about the has compared to sciences. And the first thing that I would say is don't. You can't compare yourself sort of looking at numbers against a different discipline and even within our particular school, comparing those academics within a school can be quite um, problematic depending upon their discipline areas as well. Um, the publications, how, how the publishing process works for a particular discipline is going to be different in uh, arts and humanities. Uh, there's still an emphasis on publishing <coughs> and getting a book published is a longer process to get that happening so that um, citation and metrics won't really occur sort of like in that fast paced environment that the sciences will tend to experience. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of when I sit down to talk to academics about metrics is the first thing I have to deal with is, okay, you're comparing yourself to other discipline areas, we're going to stop that now and we'll look at your profile and where you sit within that. Um, because even within some of the tools that are available, um, they will still put humanities or arts as a discipline area and then journals themselves are being compared across different disciplines and they're very different. Mm. So not understanding how those tools are working to do that um, just sort of shows you sort of what's going on so and not just trusting the number and what a number means there and just finding out a bit more about why that number is coming to being um, I think the, the the point has been made a few times yeah and look I know that you can't fix this but <laughs> <laughs> but, but that the problem is that yeah um, yeah uh, as Chris's friend found that it might just whack it on your university profile it's yeah mm. and it's it is um, problematic in, in those instances but I, it's that whole trying not to even though the number is there try not to make that sort of your life and, and crumbling around it as well <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I, yeah, I always are, feel like the altmetric score is worse because it's <laughs> like I'm so unpopular a <laughs> 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 question over here yes um, so I'm from the School of Education I'm looking at data and assessment practices in schools um, one of the things that comes up a lot in my interviews with teachers and parents um, is the use of NAPLAN as a measure of success for schools and students. Um, I've, I've just had an observation and I was wondering what you think of it. So in terms of what we've spoken about here today, comparing that as well, in those interviews it's, oh, NAPLAN is not a measure of success and you know it's just a number that they get on this thing, but ASCO does really well on NAPLAN, but <laughs> it's not important. And I did, unfortunately, I got that sense even from your responses today and in the, even the way that our guests were introduced today. Um, and the, the <coughs> well, we get these citations, we're talking about critiquing these citations, but I've had this many citations, but it's not, and it's just this kind of, duality and it's like if everyone knows it's not a good measure of your worth and your impact on how you can change the world or how your research has made actual difference in people's lives why is it that we even mention it why is it that we still use it and like it feels like I'm in the twilight zone and it's like <laughs> using something that everybody knows is 
pointless. So I'm just we're, we're having a why. whole hour session on it. Yeah. <laughs> but in, but yeah. still, in this session, we're yeah. still, yeah. Uh, you know, it's great. And we're talking about how to improve our citations at the same time as saying Absolutely. they're not a good measure. So I'm just wondering if anyone else is feeling a little bit cognitive dissonance. pulled in different yes. directions. Yeah. yeah. Where's your cognitive dissonance lying in this? Oh, down at the bottom of the to-do list. Citations. <laughs> 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 Please don't start worrying about your citations now. I don't have any. That's all right. Can I just yeah. give a quick, yeah. quick yeah. response to that? So I, th I think that's a fundamental point. Mm, I think absolutely. they're terrible measures. Yeah. I wish they weren't here. Yeah. I wish we didn't have to talk about them, and I wish we never had to say what they were. Right? Can but we just stop them? Yeah. Right, <laughs> we should have said that at the start. Except <laughs> that, except that external right authorities right who allocate money seem to think these things are important now what that means for us is how do we navigate that external set of incentives while really putting them in in our in our day-to-day -day practices where they should be which is in a deep deep back drawer and i think Thing rather than a real world. Yeah, thing. Well, so totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although, I mean, you know, being an yeah. academic theorist, like, <laughs> like so, who, who went to the real world once and didn't like it, so came back. I mean, let me, you know, I'll, I'll push back a bit on that, and I'll push back a bit in the way that I presume a, a theoretical physicist would push back, and that is that there's a place for advanced scholarship in our society that doesn't have to be measured by the degree to which it's engaging with mm. outside outside interests or communities. Mm. That's an idealistic position, but it's one that I hold to. Mm. Um, but just to finish up on, you know, to finish on what I was saying is I think that when we put it in the back drawer, knowing that at some stage we have to engage in some writing it into something, we have to think about the, ra the larger set of practices that we're engaged in, which for me, are actually about the mentoring of junior scholars and about the cultivation of sane ways of thinking about their work. And I think that's got to do with things like who is your community of scholarship or community of engagement if, you're, if you have a wider social field of engagement? What are the best ways for you to engage that community of scholarship or field of engagement? About how to, and that includes about how to write, about about who you might want to collaborate with. It's about where you want to place your work, and I think that that's a much more important thing for us to be doing. And to the extent that we're successful in helping our young scholars to think about where they place themselves in their field of scholarship and how they engage with that, or in a wider community of engagement, other stuff will follow. Right? The number stuff will follow, whether it's in alt metrics or whether it's in good reads or and it'll be relevant to the to, to the work that those people are doing, but that's what we should be doing. And that's how we reckon in my mind, you reconcile this twilight zone situation of, you know, at the one hand you've got to take it seriously, but on the other hand, you've got to put it somewhere, you know, it has to be a kind of residue. It can't be the goal and objective. I feel like we should have that put on a tea towel mm -hmm. that we have in every staff room. That's beautifully said, Chris. Thanks. Apana, you had a comment. Yeah, no, it was a similar comment, is mm. if, if what I'm hearing is quality is more important than quantity, uh, do you still mention your H index on Form A, whether you're going up for tenure or for promotion? What weight does that carry? And I was once told, oh, don't go by your Google Scholar H index, it's crap. There could be rubbish in there, whereas I wake up every day and I'm like, I'm joking. <laughs> every week and I check, yay, one more citation. Come on, H index, go up from 10 to 11. You know? And I do a small celebratory dance. <laughs> but I, I get the point is that shouldn't be your only measure of contribution to your particular narrow discipline or field. Yeah. But if you can talk a bit more about the tenure promotion process and how important is it still to this day, even though in this room we are saying it doesn't, it shouldn't, mm -hmm. not doesn't, it shouldn't really 
carry that much weight. Mm. It then comes down to the nitty gritty of going through every publication, which university, which country. Does it have to come down to that? Is my question. Alicia, did many academics come and see you for help with promotion oh, applications? All the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it around May, June? Or just <laughs> that they always come. Well, it's growing, growing. More and people know about us so, and ask about it. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say, probably leading on from the last one, is that, okay, we know citations don't equal quality. So when we teach about the quality of a publication, we still say the gold standard is the peer review, mm. as, you know, that comes before citations, really. Um, but um, yeah, so we know that on the form A, they still ask for the H index. And I guess our advice to everybody is, is, and we say this regardless of whatever you're going for, whenever you put it, and it's very unfortunate <coughs> that a website puts up a H index without any other thing else around it. Because we always say to always put a story to your H mm -hmm. index, because it doesn't say anything about at what stage of your career you're at, or your fields, or um, how many papers have you been cited, unsighted. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, not a very good measure. So we always say put a story around it. Um, and there's also the Google Scholar issue as well. So um, yeah, if you go to Google Scholar, your H index will be quite high. Um, and that's because it gets citations. It's very unknown where Google Scholar gets its citations from. So it can be from blogs anywhere on the web. And that can be gamed in itself. Like there can be, there are things out there that can create sort of fake papers that cite <laughs> your stuff. So that's why Google Scholar is dubious. We always say get your H index from a scholarly source, you know, yes. if you're going to use. What, what would you suggest for social science humanities? You can, well, we say if you are using your Google Scholar H index, make sure your profile is good and also drill down, see where your citations are coming from. There are ways to verify that, you know, you are getting genuine citations and even if you have to if you are getting citations from dodgy sources maybe calculate it yourself um, but yeah I think it's just you always got to tell a story and put those numbers in context I, it's yeah it's a bit sad that <laughs> that uni <laughs> have either of you been on a promotions panel no? many many and how I've uh, never <laughs> ever been on a promotions panel or an appointments panel that paid any at any any concern with someone's H index. Okay, good. And there frankly, go. if I sat on a committee where somebody said, oh, well, I think this person deserves it and this one doesn't because of their H index, there would be a rather heated discussion on that committee. You'd flip the table, that. wouldn't you? Uh, well, no, there'd be a heated conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pacifist, but I like arguments. <laughs> I like table flips. All right. Um, Cameron, did you have a question? I've got a oh, few I'm oh, just kind of repeating what everyone's saying. A moment's moved on. Any other questions? No? Do you want to finish up and go finish the food? Could I just offer one more comment? Oh, yeah, actually. Do you guys want to say any other things? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the story is the most important thing. Yeah, that's kind of what we've mm -hmm. been talking about. Well, I'm a storyteller, so obviously I've got a vested interest in that, but I have no interest in these numbers whatsoever. Yeah. And to me, they are a means to an end, which is getting the next grant so I can write the next book. That's how I see them. So mm -hmm. that's my bottom draw mm -hmm. response to um, numbers, pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Chris? What I was going to say is that I actually think with these numbers, we need to be, we need to show a lot of care and mentoring for junior scholars that deal with it. And we need to caution our senior colleagues about how they use their H index because there is a multiplier effect that goes with people's citations. And that is that your citations keep going up because of something that you write, wrote many years yeah. ago where people are just in their list of stuff, like work that was been published in that area, they cite that. There's no engagement with what you've written in that piece. It might have been when you first wrote it or when you, it was part of a debate, but the more, longer you're in the field, the more that that early work just becomes part of a kind of genealogy of the field in which nobody's engaging with what you wrote. And so in my mind, mm -hmm a lot of those citations are actually quite meaningless, no matter where they come from, because, the clot, because they're, they're not a measure of actual engagement with your work. And so I think senior scholars need to be very careful about how much they celebrate their citation counts. Oh, thank you for that. Alicia, any last words? Oh, okay. So one of the things earlier on you, it was about like, how can you increase your citation? So this kind of goes along the lines of research integrity. So we find if your paper, you know, to give your paper a bit more weight, if you link it to a record of the data that's behind it, that can just make, make it a bit 
you know, excitable, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much for coming along. Now, don't clap or anything yet, because I need to tell you that next month's session, we're going to have Denise Meredith here, who's, um, she has a company called Outside Opinion, but she used to be the um, chair of Humanities... What's the name of the... ARC. Yeah, at the ARC. But what's the name of the... College. The college? Yeah. Humanities and yeah. Creative yeah. Arts. Yeah. Yeah. DHCA, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and she's going to come here. She's got a couple of things going on. She's going to be doing one of these sessions, just not with a panel, just by herself, talking about the first page of your grant. So if you know anyone who's writing a grant or um, and they want some tips from someone who knows a lot um, and has a lot of experience um, about the first page of a grant. Um, and the other thing, um, we will be getting in touch with people who might have let, it, let us know that they're putting in DECRAs and future fellowships because she's also going to do a little round table with a group of scholars to pitch their fellowship ideas. So just letting you know about that. But at least do come along to, um, at least do come along to, if, if Rachel already has your name, you don't need to tell her again. Um, at least do come along to the event that's open to everybody because I think that's going to be just fascinating to hear someone with that much experience with grant um, grant applications telling you about what makes a good first page because I think that often um, getting them on the first page is a mm -hmm. quite a feat. Yeah. All right, um, I can't remember the date of that, but it's in September, I think the 13th, something like that. 13th. 13th. Thanks, Daniel. And yeah, thanks again for organising the food and everything and thanks to MAPS for the space and, and for filming it. And if you love this, tell all your friends when it comes out on our YouTube channel. <laughs> you can count the views. Yeah, count the views. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if that's what you've taken away from this, then... <laughs> all right, if you thank our panellists, that'd be great. Thank, thank you very much.